John has reminded me that I've neglected to mention two things, one being uh, that we have the uh, Social Justice Theatre next Saturday where we'll be screening a movie, well, the movie Gaza, a recent documentary, which should be very significant. This is the year that the UN declared Gaza would become unlivable. So we need to do something about that, and to do something we need to know what we're talking about. So if you can come next Saturday night, that would be great in the hall. And the other is that your service booklet, please return it. <laughs> we're running low and I, I didn't get to get any extra printed this week and um, it'll be a, take the service sheet, there's your souvenir rather than the booklet in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and with respect for the traditional owners of the land the Gadigal people and elders past present and emerging Earth's fountains fair but mock our souls like desert phantoms lure and they that drink the fainter grow the keener thirst endure. Now you're not likely to recognise the hymn from which those words are taken, words that cleverly highlight the enigma that no matter how much we drink, the human thirst for water is never ultimately satiated. You may well, though, recognise the passage from the Bible that inspired these words, namely our Gospel reading from John chapter 4, where Jesus speaks of the living waters, which you drink of it, you will never thirst again. Uh, the hymn's entitled, uh, What Never Thirst Again, and was written about a century ago by Mary Agnew Stevens. And I know it well because it was one of my dad's favourites. And growing up, he used to sing it to me. What never thirst again, no, never thirst again. What never thirst again, no, never thirst again. For he that drinketh, Jesus said, shall never, never thirst again. That's right. I don't think I've ever heard a church sing it. I used to hear my dad sing it quite a lot. And according to dad, it was one of those hymns that you sort of get one side of the church singing, what never thirst again, and the other side going, no, never thirst again. And I did toy with the idea of seeing if we could do that this morning and I even went as far as trying to download a background tune from uh, YouTube. But the only one I could find, this was, was the singing was in Thai uh, with English subtitles. And, and I'm sure, I thought, look, I'm sure Mary Agnew Stevens would be rapt to know that a hymn was being sung in Thai. But I confess I, I lost my enthusiasm as, in terms of how it would... Uh, translate into our context, so to speak. Uh, these are at any rate well-known words and images that we encounter in John chapter 4. The metaphor of the living water for the Spirit of God. And as with the well-remembered words and images of John 3, which we had last week, which spoke of new birth and the wind for the Spirit of God, these words and images again come to us as part of a dialogue between two people, Jesus on the one hand, and this time a Samaritan woman. And I think it's worth starting our probe into the gospel reading by stepping back and looking at the big picture and to how these two encounters in John, uh, given to us in chapters three and four respectively, uh, how they look alongside each other, because they're markedly similar in many ways and starkly contrasting in others. In both cases, Jesus enters into a deep theological dialogue with the person he is talking to, and in both cases, his partners in dialogue are similarly confused by what he is saying. So they're similar in those ways, but at the same time, the two people Jesus is talking to couldn't really be any more different. I mean, in John chapter 3, we meet Nicodemus, who, who is a wealthy and educated man uh, and a loved and respected spiritual leader of his people. In John chapter 4, Jesus is talking to a woman who is not a Jew and so was not respected at all by most of the Jewish people and who was also not respected by her own people, the Samaritan people. So, you know, whereas Nicodemus is rich and educated and powerful and loved and respected, this woman is none of those things. Neither wealthy nor educated nor powerful nor respected. 
I mean, she's an isolated figure, powerless and vulnerable nobody. We never learn her name. Maybe that tells us something in itself. Maybe that shouldn't surprise us. Perhaps very few people knew her name. Perhaps she didn't want people to know her name. Interesting, though, we know quite a bit about her. And we learn quite a lot about her simply by the fact that she turns up to meet Jesus at Jacob's well in the middle of the day. John tells us it was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water. Mad dogs and Englishmen. You remember the Roger Kipling quote, the only ones who go out in the midday sun. That's, okay, 19th century India is referring to. Much the same in first century Samaria. You don't go out to brave the heat of the day unless you've got a good reason to. This woman evidently had a good reason to be avoiding all her peers who would have gone out in the cool of the morning or even the shade of the afternoon. And the reason she's avoiding everybody becomes clear in the conversation she has with Jesus. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to him, you're right in saying, I have no husband. If you've had five husbands and the one you have now is not your husband, what you have said is true. Okay. You know, obviously, there's a lot more to this woman's story, but this is enough to help us understand why this woman was being shunned by her community. She had had five relationship breakdowns. And nobody respects somebody who's had five relationship breakdowns. I don't think anything's really changed in that regard. I mean, I find it hard enough to retain respect after having had two relationship breakdowns. Perhaps I should find it encouraging to be reminded there are other people out there who've had, who have had greater failures than me. Perhaps in as much as I hate having other people looking down on me, well, hey, at least I can look down on her. Of course, we don't know what caused the relationship breakdowns. Neither do we know anything about the relationship she was in when she met Jesus. But over the years, there's been plenty of speculation I mean, the assumption made by most commentators is that she's a, a sex worker of some sort. Perhaps she's had multiple children and multiple different men who eventually grow tired of her sex-addicted, money-grabbing lifestyle and rather than have her stoned, simply divorce her and move on. That's the most unsympathetic and the most patriarchal interpretation. At the other end, some speculate that perhaps this woman couldn't have children and so perhaps her partner's tired of her for that reason. If, they, if she was infertile, of course, of course that doesn't mean she wasn't to blame. I mean, surely he must have done something really bad to be cursed by God with infertility. Of course, we don't have to assume that this woman's husband's all divorced her either. Quite possible some of them died. Perhaps they all died. Okay, that in itself would make her look pretty suspicious, but... You remember the story the Sadducees told to Jesus about the woman who'd been married to seven brothers, uh, one after the other, and they'd all died on her. And perhaps the story was based on real life. Perhaps it was inspired by this woman. I mean, what's really interesting here, I think, is what Jesus himself tells us about the details of this woman's failed relationships. And the answer, of course, is absolutely nothing. I mean, we who have followed Jesus have used our imagination to fill in the blanks. But it seems to me quite significant that Jesus himself offers zero comment on this woman's failed relationships. I mean, Jesus pushes the woman to tell her about her marital status. I have no husband. Presumably because he wants to let her know that he's already fully aware of her domestic circumstances and that he does not judge her. <laughs> it's curious, isn't it? Jesus does not say, go and sin no more. He does not say, your sins are forgiven. He doesn't make any comment about the woman's sinfulness or victimhood. He affirms her for telling the truth, you have spoken truly, 
but he makes no comment whatsoever on the specifics of her personal history. But we, we don't find it so easy. We, we want to judge the woman. I mean, as, as, as you know, a, a sinner or as virtuous victim. We want to make a, a judgment just as her first century peers wanted to judge her. It's, it's the natural human thing to do, though it, it seems to me it's particularly a tendency that afflict, afflicts religious communities that when things go wrong, we search for someone to blame. We, we can't feel at peace with God or with ourselves until we have a straightforward explanation. Why do bad things happen to apparently good people? Someone must be at fault. I mean, yes, of course, I'm allowing my personal pain to affect how I experience this story. But having had two relationship breakdowns, I now find myself looking, I actually find myself looking back in wonder and admiration at the community who nurtured me through the first relationship breakdown, that, el at that elderly group of women and men, mainly women, who only seemed to ever have one question for me, which was, how can we help? I mean, that was 30 years ago. Having come round back to the same point, I find the, the far more common question this time has been, who do we blame? One friend said to me, you know, you now have no credibility having lost that relationship. I suspect that's what they said to the woman too. The key difference, I suspect, was she had no one to support her. No one, at least, until she met Jesus. Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again, Jesus said. But those who drink of the water I will give them will never be thirsty. The water I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said, give me this water that I may never be thirsty. Or he have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus, Jesus doesn't judge the woman. He offers her life. I mean, it, it, it's hard to be sure how much else of what Jesus said to that woman was properly heard. As with the Nicodemus dialogue in John's previous chapter, there, there's a play on words in the original text while Jesus is speaking about living water. The, the woman thinks he's speaking about flowing water, which is the same word in the original language. You know, flowing water in contrast to the sort of still water at the bottom of the well. Okay, look, it's hard to know what else that woman took away from the meeting. But we know that this is actually, this dialogue is actually the longest recorded dialogue Jesus has with anyone in any of the four Gospels. And that Jesus clearly took this woman seriously as a partner in theological dialogue. And this despite her being a Samaritan, being uneducated, being a woman, and being a woman who was looked down upon by her community. I don't know how many others here have read uh, Foucault's book on the prison system, Discipline and Punish, I think it was called. I, I, I read it back in my university days. I've, I've never forgotten, or at least I've never forgotten what I remember as the central premise, at least in my mind, uh, was that our correctional institutions don't really exist for the sake of correcting anybody but exist rather so that people in regular society have another group of people that they can look down on. Well, I'm sure more erudite scholars of Foucault here will tell me that's a very partial reading of the great man's work on the subject. That's what I remember. And I remember because it's an understanding that's been reinforced um, over the years that I've, I've visited various prisons around the country. I mean, we, we know the statistics that the recidivism rate, you know, the rate of those who return to prison term after term is, is horribly, ridiculously high. These places don't seem to be designed to help their clients, even so Foucault's the only one I remember being bold enough to, to suggest what the system's real function is. I mean, the village idiot was another vital member of the community who once played that role 
giving everybody else in the community someone they could feel superior to. It's the way human communities operate. We have a pecking order. We've got celebrities at the top of the pecking order and pedophiles at the bottom. I mean, even, even in prisons, you pedophiles have to have their own protection wing so they aren't killed by the other prisoners as the regular prison population needs people they can look down on as well. I mean, it's, it is. It's the way human societies work. We evaluate, we judge, we respect and we disrespect. We admire and we elevate some people when we denigrate and lynch others. And being the fickle people we are, we can switch in an instant, shouting hosannas one day and crucifying the same person the next. And that wasn't only the experience of Jesus. I think, look what's happening to Julian Assange at the moment. It, it, it's, it's the way human societies work. But it's not the way Jesus worked. In no instance in the New Testament do we see Jesus looking down on anyone on the underside of the community. On the contrary, he doesn't look down, he gets down. He gets down with those on the underside and offers them the living water that wells up to eternal life. Let me finish as I started with the words of Mary Agnew Stevens, O blessed stream of pure delight, O balm for every pain. To thee I haste, for Jesus said, I will never thirst again.